Ravaging the East since 1937 and Japan's invasion of China, reached Europe on the 1st of September 1939 with Germany's invasion of Poland. It became global on the 7th of December 1941 when Japanese aircraft attacked the American naval base at Pearl Harbor. It touched every continent and lasted for six years. It ended with a new weapon for a new age. This is the history of the greatest of all man-made events. These men are part of that history. They are eyewitnesses to the triumphs and tragedies of the war wherever it was fought. Their testimony is part of the story of how our world was made. By those who could pay, and those who could no longer meet. The price of empire. War itself demands. On the day of his third inauguration as President of the United States, Franklin D. Roosevelt scribbled a quite famous note to Winston Churchill. In it, he quoted the poet Longfellow. Sail on, O ship of state. Sail on, O union strong and great. Humanity, with all its fears, with all the hope of future years, is hanging breathless on thy fate. As ever yours, Franklin D. Roosevelt. In January 1941, when Roosevelt scribbled the note, Churchill's Britain stood alone against the totalitarian dictators. Before 1941 was half over, the Soviet Union was locked in a titanic struggle with Hitler's Germany. Before the year was out, humanity, with all the hope of future years, would be hanging on the fate of Roosevelt's great union. Compelled to join the struggle by what he termed a date which will live in infamy. The night before the Japanese hit us, my friend and I got into trouble in Honolulu. We were waiting for a taxi cab and he never did show up, so we jumped in one and it was vacant and took it for a ride. <laughs> and he they got us for malicious conversion, whatever that means. Japan did not declare war on the United States. Japan did not want to wage war against the United States. Japan knew that it could never win such a war. What Japan wanted was to nullify American power for long enough to enable it to grab such a strong bargaining position that it would walk enriched from peace talks. That meant a preemptive strike designed to keep American power out of the Japanese theater of operations. Because of the wide ocean separating that theater from the continental USA, power meant naval power. This was the reasoning that turned Japanese military planners' attention towards the closest significant American base, the great naval installation at Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. At the outbreak of the Second World War, the American army was rated 18th in the world behind that of Czechoslovakia, a country that had offered Hitler no resistance. But it had the most powerful navy in the world. If the Pacific fleet at anchor in Pearl Harbor could be crippled, then Japan could carry out its offensive and create the Greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere. Lack of natural resources, particularly oil, was the engine driving Japan's thirst for expansion. 
the sphere was a propaganda conceit. The area was known in Japan as the Southern Resources Area. Following the occupation of Indochina, the USA had imposed an oil embargo which denied Japan 90% of her oil imports. As a result, the Japanese Navy calculated it would run out of oil within a year. Action now. Tasked with launching the offensive, Admiral Isoruko Yamamoto, commander of the combined fleet, prophetically said, in the first six to 12 months of a war with the United States and Britain, I will run wild and win victory after victory. After that, I have no expectation of success. The fleet sailed on a sweeping northern course, hoping to avoid detection by patrolling aircraft or ships. Yamamoto sent the go signal. Mount Nitaka on Taiwan was the highest mountain in the Japanese Empire. Nitaka, Yamanabore, the message said. Climb Mount Nitaka. With absolute surprise, 358 Japanese aircraft in two waves began their attack at 7.48 a.m. local time on December the 7th, 1941. The incoming aircraft had been picked up on radar, but the warning had been ignored. It was assumed that they were American bombers arriving from California. We were thinking about the Army Air Force. They used to have maneuvers on Sunday morning. We said that they're kind of early this morning. Then pretty soon we saw a, a bomb drop. And he said that this isn't the Army Air Force, so it's on general quarters. And then we went up to our battle stations and fired it planes coming over. It went on for a couple hours. They said me and my gunner got credit for a plane and a half. How they figure, I don't know. We just stayed battle stations. We saw the Arizona get hit. Four out of every five men aboard the Arizona were killed. 1,100 out of the 2,403 American fatalities on the day. A lot of, a lot of the guys uh, were caught in fires and jumped over the side. Some of them drowned, some of them burnt to death, some of them. But, uh, I was one of the lucky ones in that case, so. Pearl Harbor's great installation had not been attacked of more lasting. Two of America's aircraft carriers had been at sea during the attack, and in Pearl's shallow waters, damaged ships were grounded rather than sunk. Most were quickly salvaged and repaired. December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. A board of inquiry held Rear Admiral Kimmel, commander of the fleet, and Lieutenant General Short, army commander, responsible. Reduced in rank, they were compulsorily retired. A later congressional committee found that intelligence reports available in Washington had not been forwarded to the two men who were exonerated and restored in rank. But that was not until 1999, by which time both men were dead. The day after Pearl Harbor, December the 8th, Congress voted for war with Japan. 
The motion carried in the Senate by 82 votes to none and in the representatives by 388 votes to one. The dissenting voice, that of Jeanette Rankin of Montana, a pacifist who was forced to hide from a mob after the vote and who did not contest the next election. America was at war. What that might mean on the other side of the Atlantic was not immediately clear. Congress had voted for war with Japan. Recruiting offices throughout America were forced to remain open all night. There was a skate rink at 60th Street and a boulevard. There was a plumbing store there. It was about 2.30 in the afternoon, a loudspeaker could come on, and it said, everybody were close and go home. The Japanese just attacked Pearl Harbor. I was hanging out on the corner like we did in them days with my gang of friends, and uh, we heard that Pearl Harbor was attacked. Nobody knew where Pearl Harbor was. Never heard of it before. It very clearly because at the time there was a football game going on in Chicago. When it came over the news, it was amazing the, the shock of everybody, number one. But the amazing thing was that the next day, hundreds of boys left immediately to join the Army. Our country is now at war, and I feel that I can do more good in the Navy than I can on the baseball field. One of the war's most effective and colorful spies was Richard Sorge, a Soviet agent working in the German embassy in Tokyo. Sorge had accurately warned of Operation Barbarossa and been ignored. He warned Stalin of Pearl Harbor, he was not ignored. In October and November, Stalin, realizing that Japan was not a threat because of its commitment to war with America, transferred 10 divisions, a 1,000 tanks and a 1,000 aircraft from the Siberian Reserve to face Hitler. Richard Sorge continued to provide intelligence to Moscow, torture and execution in 1944. Operation Barbarossa had faltered and failed in the mud of autumn and the snow of winter. Of the half million horses that the German army had brought into the USSR, half were dead before the spring of 1942. It was in these bitter conditions that the Red Army counterattacked. The day before Pearl Harbor, Zhukov had launched the West Front, the army grouping south of the Kalinin Front across the frozen Volga. The next day, he launched his attack south of Moscow. Вот и что мы только прошли, значит, первый посол зашли, там был противотанковый рок. Первые это видели кирченских жителей. Поскольку так много было, полный рог был забит. Даже с грудными ребятами били, лежали. On the 7th of December, the German commander-in-chief, von Braukic, resigned following a heart attack. Hitler refused to accept the resignation. In a very few days, he would change his mind and replace von Braukic with himself. Soviet forces were outnumbered by their enemy and poorer in every type of equipment for coats and boots. The Germans, anticipating victory before winter, had not equipped their army with the means to survive Russia's deadly cold. Their machines stopped working, their antifreeze froze, and so did their lubricants. 
They had advanced with transport scavenged from the conquered lands, so one armoured division, for example, had employed more than 100 types of truck and 37 types of motorbike. Such inefficiency has given rise to the opinion that how well the Germans fought masked how badly they made war. When Marshal Timoshenko's southwest front began to move forward on December 13th, von Braukic, consulting with von Bock in command of Army Group Center, agreed to a withdrawal to a winter defensive position about 145 kilometers to the rear. On the 14th, Hitler reacted furiously. He replaced von Bock. Over the next few days, he replaced Guderian and accepted von Braukic's resignation. On December the 20th, Josef Goebbels broadcast an appeal for winter clothes. Soviet losses to December 1941 were 4 million troops, 8,000 aircraft and 14,000 tanks. They had lost half their iron and steel capacity and their richest food producing region. How, from such a perilous position, the Soviet Union was able to recover and ultimately inflict a crushing defeat on the invader is a question at the heart of understanding the Second World War. А самое главное, мы тогда, значит, в основном защищали, знаете, как, вот когда танки подходят близко, значит, переходили в прямую атаку, значит, брали танковые, противотанковые гранаты, связки гранат, и бросали под гусеницы танков. Но это надо было уметь выдержать, когда танк на тебя наваливается в таких невероятно тяжелых условиях против танков Гудериана. А когда танки Гудериана наступали, за ними шла мота пехота. January the Soviet assault was renewed and when on January the 12th the commander of Army Group North von Lieb sought permission to retire behind the River Lovett, Hitler refused him. Von Lieb resigned his position. Они для того, чтобы быть, так сказать, смелее, они напивались и в пьяном виде наступали. Вот они когда танки подходили, так эти мотопехотинцы орали. Рус, давай, Рус, давай. Six days after von Lieb's resignation, Timoshenko returned to the attack, crossing the river Donets with the intention of cutting off German troops north of the Sea of Atsov. Наступали так, что немцы не выдержали атаку нашу, они стали отступать. И вот им поставили мотоцикл, я смотрю, мотоцикл с коляской, все, там это пулемет. И тут солдат подбегает и говорит, давай, я сяду в эту в люльку. Я говорю, ты, ты умеешь пулеметом -то здесь? Движениями туда-сюда вожу, он стреляет. Очень много побили мы немцев, заняли их окопы, где, откуда они шли на нас. Мальчишка, 16 лет, представляете? By early February, outgunned and underprepared, the Soviet counter-thrust was beginning to lose momentum. A success early in the month, cutting off 90,000 German troops at Demyansk, was more than offset by the loss of the Second Shock Army, moving north to relieve besieged Leningrad and trapped by a German counterattack. By the end of March and the promise of spring and fresh campaigning, the front had stabilized. The winter fighting told a story of terrible losses. Both armies would reinforce and re-equip. On April the 5th, Hitler issued Führer Directive No. 41, Operation Blue, the plan for a summer offensive to begin in late June. 
Because the Wehrmacht had survived the winter and not been forced into a calamitous retreat, as had Napoleon's Grande Armée, Hitler felt that he had defied both fate and history. We have, he told the Reichstag, mastered the destiny that broke another man 130 years ago. Not quite. From early May, fighting on the Eastern Front began to crank up. Hitler had realigned German objectives against the advice of some of his generals. Turning from Moscow, he now targeted the Donetsk Basin and, most particularly, the Caucasian oil fields. From the start of the war, the blockade had reduced Germany's oil imports by two-thirds. The Romanian and Caucasian oil fields were more than desirable. They were vital to a modern war effort. Von Manstein's 11th Army moved first, attacking in the Crimea to create a jumping off point for the invasion of the Caucasus. Stalin, despite evidence to the contrary, clung to the belief that Germany would renew her assault on Moscow. Four days after von Manstein began his offensive, Stalin permitted Timoshenko to attack towards the Dnieper, but reserved three armies under General Golikov in anticipation of the attack on Moscow, which never came. What did come was the first phase of Operation Blue, codenamed Fridericus I. It rolled back the Soviet winter offensive and broke through on a front that threatened the Caucasus to the south and Stalingrad on the line of advance. Fridericus ended at the end of May. German casualties tallied about 20,000, while Soviet losses in prisoners alone totaled 214,000. Hitler now flew to Poltava to consult with his generals and approved the plan for a summer offensive that would bring victory in the east. The artillery assault on Sevastopol began on June the 2nd. The infantry was launched on June the 8th. The Russian garrison began to evacuate by sea on June the 30th and the first six months of 1942 ended with Germany again rampaging across the Soviet Union. Behind their advance trailed those whose job it was to enforce the German plan for the East. The Germanization of the new territory and the elimination of the subhuman, the Untermensch. In mid-March of 1942, almost three quarters of those who would die in what has come to be known as the Holocaust were still alive. Eleven months later, almost three quarters of those who would perish were dead. Suddenly we were forced into the poorest part of town. 30,000 people, men, women, children, babies, pregnant women, old people, sick people, you name it, a whole population. You had to move into the poorest part of town, little shacks. But before the war, they used to live there, maybe 10, 12,000 people. Here we were 30,000. We finished up living time to a room. Because of the hygienic condition, typhus set in. So we had a double whammy. On January the 30th, 1942, Hitler had made a long, rambling speech to an enthusiastic crowd in the Berlin Sports Palace. He railed against England, mocked Churchill, derided Roosevelt, praised Japan, promised victory against Bolshevism and inevitably included his most familiar motif. We say that the war will not end as the Jews imagine it will, he said, namely with the uprooting of the Aryans, but the result of this war will be the complete annihilation of the Jews. He was speaking ten days after a conference had commenced in a villa in the Berlin suburb of Wannsee. It was called the Conference of State Secretaries, and it met to formulate 
processing between 7 and 8 million units. This was the plan for the Endlösung der Judenfrage, the final solution of the Jewish problem. Just over half of those who attended the conference had doctorates. Many were lawyers. Their orders would go out and almost 65% of their target would be met. And it would be met in all of the occupied territories on March the 27th, the first trainload of French Jews was sent to Poland. It was the first of many. Almost a million and a half of the units whose extermination the Vance Conference planned were killed not by industrialized slaughter, by gas. They were killed by men standing a few meters away, looking down the barrel of a gun. Those men were all given the opportunity of declining to serve in the killing squads. Some did. But in a regime that insisted on careful records of everything, there is no record of anyone ever being shot for refusing to serve in an Einsatzgruppen, for refusing to perform what was called Sonderbehandlung, special treatment. The extraordinary determination to see through the racist program diverted manpower and resources away from the battlefront. It was, as Talleyrand reportedly said of an action of Napoleon's, worse than a crime, it was a mistake. The attrition of large-scale fighting was draining Germany with its limited capacity to resupply of men and munitions. Russia, on the other hand, seemed to have a limitless capacity for replacement, which was now being supplemented by regular convoys of supplies from her British and American allies through Iran and into the Caucasus and via the Arctic Sea. The first Arctic convoy had left Britain in September of 1941. Churchill, who had given Stalin a personal undertaking that the shuttle would continue, insisted that the convoys go on despite mounting losses as they sailed into the Arctic summer and perpetual daylight. From the beginning of 1942, the ships carried American supplies, Lend-Lease having been extended to the USSR. And while it is weapons that win battles, it takes more to win a war. American shipments to Russia included 35,000 radio stations, 380,000 field telephones, 15,000 saws and 20,000 knives for use in amputations, and 15 million pairs of felt boots made to Soviet specifications. Some suggest that most importantly, they shipped quantities of Dodge and Studebaker trucks. All this and more was shipped on the Arctic lifeline until, on the 27th of June, convoy PQ-17 sailed for Archangel. 33 merchantmen, a tanker and more than 20 naval vessels sailed. U-boats, aircraft and surface vessels preyed on the convoy almost from the start. Ten ships reached their destination. No further Arctic convoys were dispatched until September. The losses to PQ-17 were part of the reason for suspending the convoys, but another was the pressing need to divert shipping to the supply of Malta, whose strategic significance was being amplified by events in North Africa. From its initial advance on January 21st until taking a defensive position facing the British on the Alamein line at the beginning of August, the Africa Corps had been ascendant, moving through Libya into Egypt until it threatened Alexandria and the Suez Canal. Once again, one of Erwin Rommel's officers remarked as they went on the offensive, we're rommeling ahead. The British 1st Armoured Division had 150 tanks, but seeming to have learned nothing from the invasion of France, these were still dispersed like the spread fingers of a hand. Rommel punched with his fist.
We backpedaled to dinner. We understand. Can he smash us with it? What's so better? Benghazi fell on January the 29th, and the offensive only paused at the beginning of February when Rommel's fuel stocks were dangerously low. The British managed to reform and fortify on the Ghazala Bir Hakim line. Ghazala, we dug in. They said, look, not going to step back, they said, stand here and fight. Polish, New Zealanders, Australians, South Africans. Indians, free French. That was our line at Kadala. That side was the sea, that was the soft sand. Rommel concentrated his entire force on that last section. The withdrawal to Ghazala denied the Allied Desert Air Force use of the fields in Cyrenaica, which had been crucial to providing cover for the convoys supplying Malta. That island's position now became particularly precarious. Churchill implored his desert commander Auchinleck to attack, to deny Rommel the time he needed to re-equip and to offer relief to Malta. Auchinleck promised to go on the offensive in June, but Rommel beat him to the punch, launching on May the 26th. By then, Malta's position had not been resolved, but it had been improved. On May the 9th, the carriers Wasp and Eagle had managed to get through to the island and had offloaded 60 Spitfires. The next day, the Axis found itself outnumbered in the sky for the first time, losing 12 aircraft for the loss of three of the Spitfires. By the end of May, attention was back on North Africa. Rommel up to the Ghazala line, opened the so-called Battle of the Cauldron, an attempt to punch through the line, which succeeded. On the 5th of June, the Allies launched their counter-attack, Operation Aberdeen. It was a failure. The British commanders decided to sit tight and wait for Rommel to make the next move. On the 11th, he moved. The isolated Free French at Bir Hakim finally fell after a gallant fight and Rommel, his tank force outnumbered two to one, launched into the gap between Knightsbridge and El Adem. The maneuver trapped much of the British armor in Knightsbridge where it was destroyed. These are all infantry on the back and they're coming towards us and they didn't know we were there. And when they got close enough, of course, I was picking them like mad because they were chasing me. And suddenly all the, the grounds came up onto the ridge and started knocking hell out of them. And the infantry were running about all over the place. General Ritchie, commanding the battle and without referring to Auchinleck, his CNC, ordered a withdrawal to the Egyptian border, leaving the vital Libyan port of Tobruk isolated and vulnerable. It fell to Rommel on June the 21st. One of the heaviest blows, Churchill called it, and barely beat off a censure motion in the House of Commons. An opinion poll found that more than half of the British public disapproved of their Prime Minister's handling of the war. We marched out of Tobruk whilst the Germans and Italians were bringing British prisoners into Tobruk. And we passed them, and they took not the slightest bit of notice of us. Of course, we got the boats and no oars, no paddles. And unfortunately, I got mixed up in a firefight because the next thing I knew was that I'm lying on the deck looking up at two German Africa Corps types who said to me, for you, Tommy, the war is over. On June 25th, Orkin Ritchie, Rommel had Mercer Maduna and the 8th Army was back at the Alamein line. That's when the famous Gazala gallop started. And they said, every man for himself. If you saw a truck, you get it, you die. There was no one to give you the orders. 
There was no such thing as opposite. You had to think for yourself. Nobody was there to, to take control. We were in utter disarray. The threat from Rommel was felt so urgently that the British Mediterranean fleet left Alexandria for Haifa and British HQ in Cairo began to destroy papers preparatory to evacuating. We lost hundreds. Vehicles, men, weapons. It was just abandoned. I never thought I'd ever see to look. I thought I'd see Germany first. Because he was capturing prisoners, hand over for his hand over. Thanks to intercepted messages, British intelligence was able to tell Cairo that Rommel would resume his assault on July the 1st, which he did. But the British artillery was well sighted, had mastery of the skies, and there was a sandstorm. By the 3rd of July, having advanced less than 15 kilometers, Rommel ordered his army onto the defensive. For four weeks until the end of July, British and Australian and New Zealand and South African and Indian troops all mounted attacks against the Axis position and were counter-attacked in turn. But the line hardly moved. We stopped at Alamein, and I tell you, he dug trenches. Shallow trenches, you couldn't, couldn't eat, because of rocks. I must have put a, a thousand sandbags for myself. Night and day, I was put, putting sandbags. Tell you, this murder. Churchill flew to Cairo. General Auchinleck, accompanied the Premier, would obviously come out intent on seeing everything for himself and meeting as many fighting men as possible. Having seen everything for himself, Churchill removed Auchinleck, appointing Lieutenant General William Gott in his place. The plane that Gott was travelling in was shot down on its way to Cairo. It crash-landed successfully thanks to the skill of its 19-year-old pilot. But German fighters attacked the wreck on the ground and General Gott was killed. His replacement was General Bernard Law Montgomery. Monty. When fighting resumed in North Africa in the second half of 1942, it would become apparent that the odds had shifted. The violence of global war had, meanwhile, reached into quite unexpected places. The picture-perfect island of Madagascar became a battlefield, not because it possessed valuable resources, but because it had the one asset that makes real estate desirable. Location. Its remote position, which had pre-war seen it suggested by the Nazis as the ideal place for the resettlement of European Jews, was suddenly of strategic significance. Madagascar, a French colony garrisoned by Vichy French troops, was a potential base from which the Imperial Japanese Navy would be able to threaten shipping in the Indian Ocean. On May the 5th, a mixed British Empire force seized Madagascar's main port of Diego Suarez and began an invasion that continued until the entire island had been suppressed in November. Concern for the safety of merchant shipping was also the reason for a very different type of British action much closer to home. On the night of the 27th, 28th of March, an obsolete naval destroyer, HMS Campbelltown, and a specially created commando force attacked the naval base at Saint-Nazaire. Their objective, the dry dock. If they could decommission the facility, any Axis surface vessel in need of repair would be forced to make the much longer journey north. Campbelltown was rammed into the dock gates. German defences rendered useless all of the small boats that had been the commandos intended me forced to fight, the commandos trapped had finally to surrender. After which, HMS Campbelltown, packed with explosives on a time fuse, exploded. The dry dock was unusable until five years after the end of the war. 169 men had been killed, German losses exceeded 300. 
The raid had achieved its objectives, which encouraged thoughts of more ambitious raids. An amphibious assault on Dieppe was approved and codenamed Jubilee. But Dieppe was not a Jubilee. It was nothing to celebrate. On August the 19th, a force comprising largely Canadian troops was delivered with inadequate naval support onto a shingle beach that tanks could not cross, backed by esplanade walls from behind which defenders took dreadful toll. More than 60% of the Canadians were killed, wounded or captured. The affair stands as one of the more furiously debated controversies of the war. Its apologists, describing the affair as reconnaissance in depth, claim that though it failed as a raid, the lessons learned about amphibious landings saved lives on D-Day. Others see it differently. They suggest that the lessons learned at Dieppe could have been learned by theoretical analysis of the problems of amphibious landing. They suggest that the brave men lost were victims of wasteful, shameful blundering. On the other side of the Atlantic from Dieppe, similarly flawed thinking was responsible for equally tragic losses and what German U-boat commanders dubbed their second happy time. The Battle of the Atlantic never relented. The initiative swung between Ally and Axis with changes in tactics, new ciphers, new weapons. The second happy time referred to success against shipping on the eastern seaboard of America. The introduction of convoys had been resisted and the blackout of coastal towns not implemented until Admiral King, Chief of Naval Operations, saw sense. Of King, Brigadier Dykes, Secretary to the Combined Chiefs of Staff in Washington, said he was a man of great strength of character with a very small brain. Losses from the start of the war until August, when the convoy system and other defensive measures were in effect, were 609 ships and thousands of lives lost at a cost of 22 U-boats. The U-boats were sinking American vessels off the American coast because in what may be the war's most costly decision, Germany had declared war on the USA. When Congress voted Pearl Harbor, it had been for war with Japan. President Roosevelt could still feel far from sure of carrying the Congress or the American people into war in Europe. Such anxiety was put to rest when on December the 10th, Adolf Hitler, who had not up to this point formally declared war on anyone, declared war on the United States. It may be that he hoped by going beyond the terms of the tripartite agreement he would provoke his ally, Japan, into a reciprocal declaration of war on the Soviet Union. In this, he was disappointed. Both Japan and the Soviet Union adhered stringently to the terms of the non-aggression pact they had signed in April 1941. Hitler's miscalculation was catastrophic. In November 1940, he had told Soviet Foreign Minister Molotov that the United States would not be a military threat until at the earliest 1970 or 1980. When he spoke, America had an army of 100,000. By 1945, the United States had 14.9 million personnel in uniform. 
It exposed the rank stupidity of Nazi racist prejudice. Foreign Minister Ribbentrop had asked, when has a Jewified nation like that ever produced fighters? Winston Churchill knew better. By America's entry into the war, he said, Germany's fate was sealed, Italy's fate was sealed, and as for the Japanese, he added, they would be ground to a powder. Hitler's gift to Roosevelt was a godsend to first meeting of the Allied leaders after America's entry into the war, the Arcadia Conference in Washington from the end of December 41 to the middle of January 42, had several important outcomes. The draft charter of the United Nations was won. The formation of the so-called ABDA Command, American, British, Dutch, Australian, which would cooperate against the Japanese in the Far East was another. For Churchill, the most profound outcome was the president's decision, which, without Hitler's declaration of war, would have been politically impossible, to endorse Churchill's master strategy for the war. Hitler must be defeated first, before attention turns to the destruction of Japan. By mid-January of 1942, Japan's extraordinary progress across the Asia-Pacific region must have been giving some in the American High Command reason to question the call. And many did. Japan's outrageous plan left the greater part of its army in China, whilst a vast and rapid conquest was launched hours before the strike on Pearl Harbor. The Kotobaru Field Force at of Malaya two and a half hours before the first bomb fell on Pearl Harbor. Three hours after the attack on Pearl, the Japanese attacked Hong Kong. Soon, attacks would begin on the Dutch East Indies, on the Philippines, south towards New Guinea, and thrusting down the Malay Peninsula to Singapore, more than 6,000 kilometers from Tokyo. The Japanese would spread through the Pacific, a vast but not an empty ocean. A ring of fortified islands would make the co-prosperity sphere defensible, and these would include islands, formerly German colonies, that had been ceded to Japan at Versailles. The Marshalls, the Carolines, and the Marianas. In just six months, the Imperial Japanese Army and Navy would be in possession of one-sixth of the Earth's surface. In the next episode of The Price of Empire, Japanese military forces surge across the Asia-Pacific region, seemingly unstoppable and unbeatable. The middle of 1942 is the middle of the war. And in the second half of the year, at Midway, at El Alamein, and in Stalingrad, the tide begins to turn. <laughs>